Hi, and welcome to the Indie Music Podcast, the podcast for independent musicians and other audio professionals. We're your hosts. I'm Matt Denton, also known as Mojo of Ragged Birds Music. I'm a Bay Area mix engineer and recording artist. And Douglas Reynolds of Resonance Mastering, a mastering engineer in Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome to episode 211 of the Indie Music Podcast. On tonight's episode, Matt and Doug talk about gardening and contemplate what the real content purpose of this show is. They then talk about using headphones for mixing and mastering and their experience with open and closed back types. Finally, getting to the actual topic, they discuss loudness and streaming platforms and provide some strong opinions on the matter. Enjoy the show. Hey, Doug. welcome. <laughs> what's, what's happening? What is happening? How are you doing? I'm doing great. You're, um, you sound a little staticky or something. Do I sound staticky? Static. Yeah, a little staticky. Hmm. A little fuzzy. Are you, are you been hitting the bourbon? Are you a little fuzzy? No. <laughs> <laughs> How about if I back off? Is that? It's a little cleaner. Is that cleaner? Uh. Versus where I was sitting, which was right here. Well, if you sound good to you, then it must be uh, the network or Zoom or something like that. I'm feeling a little self-conscious now. <laughs> <laughs> I made you snort right on. <laughs> so far, this is like the most boring podcast ever. <laughs> I don't know. Can you hear me? I don't know. Can you hear me? <laughs> How do I sound? Oh, man. We've been doing interviews, and uh, I feel like we haven't really like caught up. We've been busy with work. And I just feel like we haven't sat down and chatted for a while. It's true. How are how are things? Is it still snowing there where you are? No, no, it's beautiful. It's been nice. Forties uh, and fifties, and no more, no more uh, tundra. And yeah, it's been great. <laughs> no more tundra. Oh, uh, yeah. I've already mowed the lawn once. I could have mowed it again, but I'm waiting for the weekend. Yeah, I've got like, I guess if we're going to talk about yard work. <laughs> <laughs> let's take this podcast like, to let's, a different let's level. Let's take now. it wherever. Let's we're just take we're it gonna wherever. go to gardening now. <laughs> we're going gardening. <laughs> <laughs> it's that time of year. Yeah, I got, I, got, I got a rake. <laughs> I got a fertilize. I got I got all this stuff to do. Oh, fertilize. Yeah, I probably got a weed and feed. And, um yeah, I'm, I'm I'm my project, you saw a picture of it. I'm replacing a, a planter box and uh you know, if I was a small crew of guys who do this for a living, I could have knocked this out in probably a weekend. Um, but I'm not. So it's taken me. Yeah, well, why would few, you want to be an overachiever? Weeks. Yeah, it's taken me a few weeks. I'm doing this by myself and it's. Perfection you know, takes time. It's a. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's not get my hopes up there. Uh, <laughs> you know, the. Uh, be, I just, it's like this, all this old rotted wood I've ripped out and I'm putting in a nice new stuff. It's been kind of a design build project where the scope has a little bit changed as I've gone along, which is part of why it's taking so long. You kind of build it and then design it. Yeah. A little bit of build it. it and, and then the wife says, Hey, you know what? That should be taller or <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. Like, Oh, okay. I guess I got to go back to home Depot. <laughs> we see who the project owner is now. Yes. Well, I thought that was always clear. I just, I just take direction, you know, <laughs> and not very well. <laughs> so what yeah. were we talking about tonight? Well, oh, I wanted to say one thing. One thing I, all the stuff I've been wanting to talk to you about, and I just, I forgot most of it. But the one thing I wanted to say was, um, remember last time I was here on my, my, uh, semi open back cans and uh i kept saying oh i gotta pause because there's a helicopter i gotta oh there's you know noisy yard work and all that stuff you know none of that made it into the final recording it just like i could hear it but it never made it into the i don't know if the if the gate caught it or if it just seemed louder in my ears than it did to the microphone or what but yeah none of that stuff i couldn't find any of that i thought i was gonna have to edit all that stuff out and it just wasn't even there maybe you so were talking really quick. yeah well, I think in a little, in a, in kind of a way, I feel like these semi open back headphones amplify some of the sound, like holding a seashell to your ear in a way that closed backs never do. And I don't know if that's just a getting used to it kind of a thing or if it's really true, but I sound louder to myself when I'm wearing the open backs than when I'm wearing the closed backs. But interesting. Maybe it's supposed to be that way. I don't know. Anyway, the point is, 
I all don't the stuff that was really loud to me just never made it to the recording. So the whole I, I open back less. thing is foreign to me. You'll have to like ship me your extra pair of open backs so I can try them out. There you go. Yeah, I don't love them, but you know they're they're useful for certain things. I feel like I, I feel like you can't sneak up on me when I'm wearing these. You know, because oh. <laughs> I can hear the room kind of. Um, yeah, I've just I've just been. Closed back since the get go. I mean, even back decades, uh, I've always have had closed back, and yeah, for hi fi listening and things like that, I just always preferred them. I don't know. No, I still prefer them for sure. I bought these on uh, like Sweetwater's recommendation as you know the top five uh, studio headphones under X dollars, and I was like, oh, this seems like a good deal. I could always use an extra pair, um, but I don't love them. <laughs> more certainly don't like them more than my uh my trusty sony's and they're not i don't i don't feel like they're very high fidelity but they're they're fine for podcasting yeah they're not that i don't like them for what i use my sony's for which is you know that really fine-tuned minute listening for every lip smack and and uh bad edit and clicks and pops and all that stuff that you really need to you know zoom in on when you're when you're editing audio would you say that you use headphones and you're mixing the majority of the time um in the past uh it was exclusive and now i'm about 50 50 i trust my ears with these callies a lot more than i did at the outset and um i still mix about half the time with the cans on just so that I can get, um, you know, just so I can, especially when I'm doing like vocal editing or, um, you know, like the, the editing stuff. When you sit down to start your session, are you open air or in your cans? Um, cans. Cause I really want to focus on what each thing is before I start the blending. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, it does. Like, it, like I really, because I'm not familiar with the material yet, so I want to get to know it. And I feel like the only way I can really focus on it uh, is to have it in my directly in my in my trusty Sony cans because I know what they sound like. And um, I don't I don't yet need to know what it, what the music sounds like in the room because I'm just auditioning tracks, uh, seeing what each is, kind of getting an idea of where they're gonna fall in the mix, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't really have a. Uh an opinion on the matter because I, I just feel like use what works best for you that you get best results from, you know, that's, right. and if you mix or even master with cans, then, you know, if that's working for you, then I think that that's the perfect thing for you. Then, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I, um, you know, when I first started this, I immediately bought, you know, some studio monitors, which I, uh, sold at the end of last year um they were fine they were the space i was in was not good enough for them to sound good in and i could only really do it when nobody was home because you know it's a small house and so i immediately you know picked up some some nice headphones and went with those and have been using those for basically a decade so i got really comfortable uh using those and uh, proficient in using those but now that I finally have basically a dedicated space for mixing and mastering and audio production, it's I've, I've been transitioning. Um, so now I almost use the headphones uh, as a additional source. You know, like when you're want to make sure that things sound good everywhere, right? So now I'm I'm I'm, I'm transitioning to mixing mostly on the uh the studio monitors and then you know fine tuning with the headphones and of course i'll listen on earbuds and then i'll listen on um you know i'll take a walk and listen on my wireless earbuds and uh yeah i just kind of i listen to them different ways yeah see for me when i try to do in the context of mastering Mm -hmm. um if i master in headphones i find that the work that i do there doesn't translate out to um, to speakers or to other types of of uh, listening in open air uh, that I desire to get, but going the other direction and 
mastering in open air and then doing confidence checks for whatever and how the balance and things like that is in headphones. And a lot of that is, is how does the bass sound in the headphones? Because it, right. the, the headphones don't reproduce the bass as well as what I get in my studio system. And, right. and you have a subwoofer too. So that's. Yeah. And, and so I find I get better translation if I do my masters in open air and then do my checks in headphones and earbuds and things like that, which I do. But I, I don't have the same level of consistency if I try to do that in headphones first and then try to take it out to open air, if that makes sense. Oh, that's sense. interesting. Yeah. And you, you say that's mostly because of the, the low-end translation? I think so. Yeah, it, that could very well be my headphones, which they're pretty decent headphones. You know, not the most expensive pair in the world. I, they're on my head, so I don't remember what the heck I got. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, they're, they're okay. I think that they're as good as as what most people listen on, and that's why I check with them. And then, you know, also like AirPods. And and then recently, I was telling you the other day, I was kind of excited about it because I've got this a media server set up in my home now. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so now I can just on network uh, transfer files over to my media center and then go up and then do checks on my hi-fi system. Yeah, that's so cool. Which I really hadn't been able to easily do before. And then I've never really liked doing checks on Bluetooth because Bluetooth doesn't reproduce dynamics the same way as like Spotify Connect, okay, where you're where you're actually streaming directly from Spotify versus streaming from Spotify and then over a Bluetooth connection. Right. There's a lot of loss there. Sure. And, and so I, I never really liked having to do that. So this is nice because I can put it directly on the media server and then play it direct, uh, you know, into my system off of that. So that's kind of a new confidence check process that I've got going right now that I've been having fun with. Yeah, that's super cool. And I love the term confidence check. That's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, you immediately get a picture of, you know, the guy taking his mix out to the car and just like crying because <laughs> it's worked so hard and it sounds like crap. Yeah. You know, honestly, um, I haven't done the car in a long time. Yeah, I haven't either. Cause, uh, I, well, I used to, I used to have, I used to, because my, my car has a CD player, but no Bluetooth. I would basically do like you know three mixes you know like a vocal up vocal down um something else and then i'd burn them onto a cd take them out to my car and listen to them and go okay this one needs some work okay that one sounds pretty good okay that one you know and i don't (laughs) know my computer doesn't have a cd (laughs) burner and uh yeah that became so i kind of stopped doing that and started doing um started streaming to my, you know, my Alexa device. And so there's some stuff to unpack there, which is, uh, you know, I, I like that you have that, that hi-fi setup is, is just uh, enviable for sure. Um, well, I think a lot of people, I mean, it's, it's a way that a lot of people listen and, but I think the majority of people probably listen on their devices in earbuds. I don't know. That's, that's a, kind of a general. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. I, mean, I think most of, people do stream from Spotify to their phone, to their Bluetooth earbud. And yes, that's levels of degradation and levels of law. Although I, you know, yeah. I don't, you know, I know what the music's supposed to sound like. I mean, Judas Priest sounds like Judas Priest and it sounds pretty good coming over Spotify into my earbuds. Right. Does Would it sound better on a hi-fi? Of course, yeah, I'm sure it would, but it sounds, it sounds. Or it could sound worse. Good. Or. Because <laughs> on a highly true. resolving system, it might reveal more than what you're able to hear on yeah. a less resolving system, you know? So that's why I want to always do these checks on highly resolving systems. So my, my studio is different. It's, it's designed for critical. It's not forgiving. My hi-fi system is. It has color to it, and mm-hmm. and it, it has its own character. And I like listening right. for pleasure on that much more than I like listening for pleasure in my studio system, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And um, I've I've gotten used to doing both on my studio system. I actually do just kind of like, it's too quiet out here. Sometimes I'll, I'll just stream music and I did these speakers just sound good. Um, 
it's not, you know, this, it's not a, a mastering quality, quiet, hear a pin drop across the room and tell me what frequency it is uh, <laughs> kind of sound. But, um, I mean, you know, music sounds good. And that's why I audition on so many different things because I know how people listen to music and I want to make sure that whatever I think it's supposed to sound like, it does still sound good when I put it over Bluetooth or I put it over, you know, I'll listen on one earbud just to kind of make sure that I'm not fooling myself with the stereos. And like very often you listen, if you just put one earbud in, you'll go, oh, wow, the vocals are really louder than I thought they were or something like that, you know? Um it's like it's like auditioning in mono, but not. And I don't know what the difference exactly is, but um, I will. That will reveal certain things that uh, about that um, putting your two bus in mono does not reveal, in, yeah. in my opinion. Now, you know, speaking of the car checks, my wife, uh, her car has what I think are the NS tens of car stereo <laughs> speakers. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. And, and you can say that to her and she goes, I don't know what that means. She has no idea what that means. And, <laughs> and, the, and the thing is, is that if, if it sounds like crap, it is crap in there. Right. Okay. Right. And, but you can put a professionally engineered uh, CD in and it sounds fantastic. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. So if, if your mix sucks, it's unforgiving. It mm. hits you in the face <laughs> and slaps you. <laughs> Three or four times, you know, it, it takes you in the alley. It, it does. It, it knees you in the gut, you know, and it it takes you down <laughs> to yeah, depths that you that. had thought you could never reach. Okay, and that that is fascinating. I've had that ex- that very experience where I go, "What? What did I do wrong here <laughs> to make it sound like that?" <laughs> and so you know, and thank goodness. That we've had that horrible car stereo. Yeah. Because when it's right, it's right. And it definitely rewards you for that too, you know? So I spent a lot of time in that car. I haven't been doing that for a while now, but mostly more on mixes when I was mixing that. So I was spending my time yeah. in the car. Um, But yeah, so it's, you know, the whole idea of translation is really important to me. And of the work that I'm doing, it's, it's kind of an expectation, you know. I think in the mix, in the you know, in that's intended to be masters or pre-master, translation isn't the big thing. It's more balance and how everything comes across in the mix and and the quality of individual tracks and you know how they're presented and and staged in the in the stereo field and things like that. Yeah, but it still needs to be like representative of the final product in a way that it makes the client happy. So that yeah. like, yes, that's what it's supposed to sound like. And then you're like, wait till it gets mastered. You'll like it even better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, a, a really good mix coming in for pre-masters. There's always the occasional mix that comes in and I start working on it and I dump what I'm doing because it's not better than yeah. what came in, you know? Oh, that's interesting. And I do get that. And I love it when that happens because, you know, game on. Okay. Challenge accepted. <laughs> challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what can I do here? What does this need? Yeah. You know, and, and listening to it says, man, this sounds so good, you know, and it, and it makes me, it forces me to really focus mm-hmm. and determine what little nuance things really need to happen in order to bring this up to potential, you know, and that's, that's really fun. There's well, no, let me ask you. no corrective work in that. It's all trying to work with enhancement. Yeah. So when you get to that point, when it comes in and it's so close and it's so good that you barely need to touch it, what are you looking for at that point? Because it probably already translates well. So are you looking for um, some additional, um, you know, vibe to add? Are you looking for just like the merest of how can I make this sound uh, like, the best commercial quality it can, like bring the kick up just a little bit. And bring yeah. That, ty- that type of thing. Uh, I might do hair. some, some analysis on it and take a look at what's actually happening in a visual aspect mm-hmm. and to help identify and get my ears focused into certain areas of the song. Or if I mm-hmm. see some, uh, some really high peaks happening in 
you know, like the 80 hertz range or something where the, you know, the bass and the kick and how they're interacting together. Right. And, you know, maybe it's a nuanced thing looking at and using visual tools to um, help focus where I want to listen can help with that a lot. And uh, I think depending on genre, there may be other things, like you said, with vibe and stuff. So maybe, maybe, you know, depending on, on the style of music, adding some transformer, some tape saturation, oh, yeah. um, some, some things like that to, to give it warmth, you know, maybe it's like really great, but it's just kind of, um, uh, what, what's a good word? It's just kind of sterile in a way. Right. Right. And maybe bringing some imperfection into it in a way of, yeah, I find that can be true of, of digital productions. Yeah. Like they'll, they'll, yeah. Sterile is a good word because uh, it's not that they're not, you know, technically good, but they just lack a little bit of, yeah, warmth or again, sometimes you get stuck trying to talk about sound with words and it doesn't quite do it justice, but you know it when you hear it. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big fan of, of saturation uh, from transformers. Yes. And I think that that sounds really good when it's done well, it's done lightly and that saturation just kind of adds to the overall warmth and vibe of the song. Uh, again, that's genre specific. I think that works really well with quieter, really dynamic songs mm-hmm. that could be in folk or blues or, uh, you know, jazz, or if you, you know, if there's something that you want to give kind of a, you know, maybe a uh, kind of a classic analog vibe. I was trying to avoid the word analog, but it's really what we're talking about. <laughs> You know, yeah, it is ironic when you want to say, because I mean, I feel like that's my wheelhouse is the analog vibe, but I'm working completely in the box. So analog has nothing to do with it. Yeah. But I know what you're talking about. I know what you mean. Yeah. There's definitely stylistic things that you, you know, you could do there, but, and then obviously, you know, the, what everybody expects is, is that you're going to be working with loudness. Right. And which finally brings us to our topic. Yeah, that we were going to actually talk about. And I yelled um, earlier this is trying good. to get this into This is it. good. <laughs> <laughs> this has been good so far. And then I talked really quiet. And yes. We talked and about no one caught on. Loudness. Though. It felt well, like. Well, I. Oh, no one meeting me. Yeah, no. I was just <laughs> listening for the static. Um, you had kind of an analog fuzz fuzz vibe going on. <laughs> Maybe my transformer's still on. Maybe it's a transformer problem. <laughs> um, yeah, we were, uh, we were having a discussion about uh, how. And I, and I went this way after a brief period because there was the whole, oh, for Spotify, you want to, you know, minus 14 luffs, this should be your target. And, you know, minus 12 if you have to, or maybe make two versions, one for if they're going to do a CD and one of the, and, I, you know, I, I'm, people say what they want about Spotify, but I just find it really, it has all the stuff that I like and I stream it all the time and yeah. I take walks and I work out with it. it sounds and, like it's uh, going to be getting know, better too. I'm on the family plan, so it's cheap for me. I don't, yeah. you know, I, it's like one monthly fee and four four or five people in my house can listen to it on their own account. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I'm running, um, we're running a Spotify family plan here. And then yeah, I also totally have a, I, I have a title, the Hi-Fi with the, the Mastering Quality account. Oh, cool. I use that for, well, personal interest because I, I want to have a solid experience opinion on high quality streaming yeah. services. And I also have clients who have published works out there and I want to compare how their work sounds on title, you know, master quality versus Spotify yeah. and, and things like that. That's, that's smart. I've never, I don't know anybody who's on title and I've not listened to it. Um, I do know people who are on Google play and prefer that. Mm-hmm. I do listen to music on Bandcamp all the time. Um, I'm really happy with both. Uh, the, the thing is, it's it's not necessarily, okay, opinion time. It's <laughs> not really necessarily better, in my opinion, than CD quality audio, okay? Okay. And maybe it's not better than CD quality audio. Um, and But I don't think CD quality audio is as good as playing on vinyl. And so maybe that'll raise some eyebrows here, you know, but there's that warmth again. There's that right. whole thing around the experience of vinyl, you know, and, and music to me is a, as a listener is, is it's an experience thing and it's an emotional right. and it's an involvement <laughs> thing, you know? And I, 
ever since CDs came in, it was it was removing involvement from listening and making listening more convenient. You know, and then C- yeah. CDs promised to have higher quality, but that's it's subjective. You know. Yeah, I feel like there was um, there's there's a difference between fidelity and pleasantness. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, you remember when CDs came out and, uh, I guess this probably happened with DVDs too, but, uh, you'd look for the little, you'd look for the little three letter code, you know, if it was an AAD, was oh, it, yeah. a, was a DDD, meaning it was recorded digitally, transferred digitally, right. and then pressed digitally. Like if it's digital from beginning, from end to end, um, that had to be the highest fidelity, highest quality. And if it was AAD, it means it was originally recorded anal- uh, analog, then transferred and then uh, finally recorded digitally onto disc and you know yeah that seemed like that seems now like, like such a silly thing to pay attention to yeah. and just fooling ourselves into thinking that one was better than the other did it sound good is yeah. the real question i think what it really comes down to is that you can have like a really poorly recorded piece that sounds very poor on the <laughs> on the best medium that you enjoy right. the most you know and it doesn't sound good yeah you know, and or you could have like a a very highly skilled production that was recorded perfectly and engineered to the best <laughs> specifications. You know, everything mm-hmm. was done uh, perfectly, and you have an outstanding sounding recording, um, especially on vinyl. And that it really mattered on vinyl a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, and loudness is very important on vinyl um, because of dynamics. Right. Too loud of a uh, of a master on vinyl results in skipping of the needle or shrilling highs of sibilance. Yeah, it has to be within a certain range that probably translates better uh, to the human hearing experience. Yeah, um, and that's just, true. I feel like the 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 analog, the <laughs> the corollary, the the uh, you know the. This the similar experience is what um, what film looks like uh, taken with an analog camera versus a digital photo that may be just so crisp and so perfect, but it lacks that kind of warmth and and uh, kind of the way the human eye sees and the brain perceives things. It's different and maybe not better. Yeah, and well, again, it's subjective, and and it's not to say that I think that you should listen to CDs or I, I think you should listen to to, L, to LPs and vinyl because I I think one is better than the other. I think that I'm saying that I enjoy one over the other because of the emotional response that I I I have to it. Yeah, and the enjoyment that I get from it, which is whatever brings you the most joy, you should be doing that. You know, <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally. And um, right now, that's that's for me. That's streaming Spotify because I don't have a I don't have a record player hooked up. Yeah, I don't have a, a easy way to listen to CDs. And even I mean, I, I must have like five hundred CDs. And um, honestly, I I've spent a lot of time ripping those CDs to MP3 and listening to those for years and years and years. And uh, it's, to me, Spotify sounds better than MP3s ripped from CD, even if they're good quality MP3s. Yeah. And I'm, I hear things in songs that I've listened to for a decade that I never heard before. And I don't know if that's, you know, the way that they pass things through a, you know, an EQ, you know, the way they do on the radio, everything passes through a certain uh, set of compressors and EQs so that, you know, the, the Beatles from 1964 sounds as uh, the same loudness and sounds like it can sound right next to, you know, a modern recording of John Mayer or something yeah. on the radio. So th- there's a lot of processing that goes on there to make it seem like they're all kind of, especially in broadcasting, together. you know, and that's normalization yeah. and they're using right. the compression and limiting on that. To, and there's also laws around that too. Sure. Uh, more in um, broadcast TV, but I think, yeah. you know, broadcast radio has their own set of regulations as well. Yeah, what I'm saying is that, that basically the streaming services are the new broadcasting. Yeah. And so they do their own version of level matching. And that's where that, you know, that minus 14 muffs guideline came from. But yeah. I'm finding, and this is kind of what I was started to say, was that stuff that originally was on CD, you know, like say Red Hot Chili Peppers or something, and then they put that out on Spotify, that sounds better than stuff that people are trying to 
game the 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 algorithm and game the the luffs like oh you got to put it at this luffs because it's going to sound better on street no just yeah. put it at the at the stuff the, the level that sounds good and that's usually probably in the minus six to minus 12 range it didn't take me long to figure out that you know what i'm I'm trying too hard to make stuff sound like it's going to be good on streaming when it really just sounds good if you just do the same thing you used to do yeah. and put it out. And that's that's entirely genre specific, you know, because minus yeah. six is loud, man. It is loud. I mean, <laughs> peak, <laughs> peaking minus six. I don't mean like sustained minus six. Yeah, I just did some uh, like some metal uh, hard rock stuff and I decided to go for it, you know, and I ended up about, you know, 5.4 in that neighborhood. Mm-hmm the final mm-hmm. master and the music it worked really well for that genre of music if i tried to do that to some funk or soul or folk or something like that it would trash it yeah when your when your integrated average is converging on your rms peak <laughs> you know you <laughs> you, know. you no longer have any dynamics left in the song yeah and i'm that is something i'm really aware of what am i doing to the dynamics because the dynamics make the whole, they make the whole song, they make the whole vibe and how it feels, you know, and if it's all yeah. leveled off. And I know that there's mastering engineers out there, real popular ones that talk about, yeah, if you can't get a, you know, a song loud without losing dynamics and you suck as a mastering engineer, <laughs> you know, and, the, you know, honestly, they can kiss my ass about that. Okay. Cause, because, you know, that's, that's hype. That's uh, commercial uh, competitiveness. Okay, and it doesn't have the the song is the most important thing in in the uh, in the mastering process, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. And boy, it's fun funny to hear you get fired up about something. <laughs> I, they can kiss my they can kiss my ass. <laughs> but no, I totally agree. And yeah, I I do I do forget because I I'm pretty much exclusively hard rock, uh, heavy rock, metal, alternative. Yeah, I don't I don't. I don't really have too much occasion lately to do much, you know, folky, poppy stuff that a lot of the stuff ends up being around 14 minus 14. Yeah. Yeah. And it's perfect for that, that song, you know, nine is for CDs and things like that. But anymore, I don't even worry about that because I used to think that, well, CD is going to be 44.1. It's going to be 16 bit and it's going to be nine luffs. Okay. Yeah. And that's not, I was wrong. (laughs) It's going to be 44 and it's going to be 16, but whatever the loudness is of it is going to be what it needs to be for the music when, when I'm done. I spend about five minutes in the very beginning of a session setting levels Mm -hmm. and getting, getting an initial loudness set. And I don't know what that is. It it just depends on what levels the pre-master come into me. Right. A pre-master, I would say, shouldn't ever be coming in louder than minus 16, okay? There should be, you know, integrated lefts. Yeah. And there should be a, right around maybe negative six or less a dB of headroom available, yeah. you know, when it comes in. So the mix isn't very loud. And if I got if I got a mix in at negative 20 or 22, that's great. I can totally work with it. I can take a negative 20 or 22 mix and in metal and get it to eight or nine with the work that I'm doing. I can't do that with funk or blues or jazz or something like that because that would be squashing it. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, and not that dynamics in metal are less important or anything, but having compression, it's, just a, different, and, and it's a different kind it of works. sustained it's, energy. Yeah. And, and that energy and that compression is desirable in that genre of music. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh Yeah. And I think a lot of the uh, the mastering engineers who are talking about squashing dynamics and things like that, you know, and come to think of it, they're they're all mostly metal and hard rock that they're talking right. about, and and that is just one area, and there's one type of process application to the genre. So I think you need to work with, you know, if you're a mastering engineer or a mixing engineer who's working with lots of different genres of music, then there's going to be lots of different aspects to how you treat that music when in the context of loudness and how you achieve it and yeah. what's appropriate. Yeah. Well, if you're paying attention, if you're good at your job, like legitimately good and paying attention to the program material, making sure that you are serving the song as always is, is our mantra. Serve the song. Song is king. Yeah. So anyway, 
Yeah, I totally agree. I haven't had a concern for what the heck Spotify or anybody else is saying that their integrated left specification is for over eight months now. I don't think I've cared. Yeah, I haven't either. And you know what? I don't, it's not for me. It wasn't coming from them. It was people, it was like, you know, all the advice that you hear on the internet from even respectful, you know, respectable sources um, go back and forth. I'm not going to name any names right now, but I know you know who they are. You know, who will who will give recommendations on you know loudness and recommendations on you know just your RMS and your lofts and your peaks and your stuff. And it it is one genre dependent, and two, um, it matters less than than they say. I think that sometimes people just want to make content for you to hear and they'll backpedal that stuff six months later. But, yeah. you know, in the end, it just needs to sound good and it needs to translate across um, different speakers and, and whatever people are listening to. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, a song mastered and done well at nine lofts or louder, this stuff that I just did at, at 5.4 or whatever it was, it sounds good on Spotify. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And, yeah. and Spotify isn't crushing the dynamics of the song because it's too loud. It isn't no, doing any of these things that everybody warned us would happen. If it, if you didn't get this, you know, your loudness set at negative 14 or negative 12 at the most for Spotify loud because they have the Spotify loud thing, you know. Yeah. Then, they they would turn you know, your music's going to sound like shit on there. And I can guarantee you that is not the case. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. I listen to Spotify all the time, and this song sounds good next to that song, and it sounds better if it came from a CD. It sounds better if it came from you know the uh, what was pre pre Spotify advice for for Luffs and and RMS, and so it was probably pre Luffs. In fact, yeah, um, it it does sound better because it was just mastered to and mixed and mastered to sound good yeah wherever usually you know where was it the radio was it cd it didn't it didn't really matter but yeah the advice coming out was that if it wasn't if it wasn't 14 then they were going to turn it down and it was going to be quieter and you were going to your music was going to suffer compared to the commercial stuff well it's just yeah. not true well and what what they were really doing and i don't actually know where that was coming from i don't think it was coming from the platforms no it wasn't was that if you come in too loud they're going to apply compression and it's going to mm-hmm. squash your product you know that your 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 music that you're releasing and and it's going to reduce um, the quality and it's it's going to sound awful, yeah. And it, it struck fear into everybody, and so, so it's all oh my god, you know. So um, uh, Apple they want negative sixteen, and you know minus sixteen lefts, and Spotify wants uh, minus fourteen or minus twelve, and then uh, but YouTube doesn't care. You can go as loud as you want, <laughs> and you know right. uh, SoundCloud doesn't care, but we're not actually sure um, <laughs> because they might have something, but nobody knows, and. So it's like, how many versions are you going to produce? I used to do that. (laughs) I used to have like a negative 16 for Apple and a, and a negative 14 or 12. And then I do Mm -hmm. like a, um, a negative nine for with a 44.1 16 bit version in case clients wanted to go to CD Yeah, or they could use that one, you know, wherever they wanted that they wanted to get their loudest master on, you know, but yeah, I don't, I don't do that anymore. Yeah, I did that briefly too. No, I had a, like, here's your minus 14 for streaming and here's your minus 12 for CD or wherever else you want to put it. And uh, yeah, that was a brief period that, and I realized quickly. Yeah, I mean, of course I do on request, you know, if if you want a particular loudness level that doesn't hurt, you know, I mean, obviously if we're going quieter, if you want a quieter one, (laughs) sure. You know, um, I'm usually going as loud as I think, I can get with the song. I mean, that's my, my goal is to get the song as loud as I can without causing any damage the to the song. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. to get the loudness out of it and music sounds better, louder. And I agree. Although there's a volume knob for that. Yeah. You know, and, <laughs> but the thing is, you know, at, at minus 14 or minus 16, you used to have plenty of volume knob to get it loud, you know? So it's, it's, it still works. Yeah. I will tell you though. And this is, this is the thing that everybody seemed to ignore who was giving advice like that. And this is why MP3s are so popular. Uh, it was because when you're jogging, when you're in the gym, when you're working out, when you're driving in your car, none of those are quiet environments. You want to be able to hear the music over whatever else is going on around you when you're listening. 
it needs to be kind of squashed. It needs to be kind of compressed. It needs to be kind of loud um, from the get-go and not have like these, you know, classical music passages where you just simply can't even hear what's going on for minutes at a time. That just doesn't fly. Yeah. But when you're home and you're on your highly resolving system, it needs to sound amazing, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know how many people do that anymore, which is why I envy you that luxury. Um, I will say one more thing. This uh, is because I just did this yesterday. I uh, Just as a test, I had a, I was mixing a song where all the, uh, all the stems, all the tracks were, came in at 44 and one. And um, I just wanted a test because I figured, okay, this, somebody else is going to master this. So I'm going to, I'm going to bounce this out. At, and um, upsample it to 48. So it was 24, 44, 1. And I wanted, to, and I decided, you know what? I'm going to try this both ways and see if I can tell the difference. So I bounced it out at 24, 41, 44, 1. And then I bounced it out again at 24, 48 with um, dither. And it was noticeable. The, the four, even though the, even though the stems were 44, 1. And even though it was ups, upsampled afterwards, uh, the the forty eight um, K one was noticeably like wider and deeper, and um, I want to say it was a little louder. Huh. Does that make sense? Do you don't think that was my imagination? Well, I would only add dither on downsampling personally, um, because that's when you're losing information, and uh, so you've got uh, basically. In digital, you've got gaps in data, right. and and then the pro, the dithering process actually adds noise, correct, back in to fill those gaps that were made in that lossy operation of reducing. Right, right, right. Um, but on upsampling, there's no reason to do that. Uh, it could be that you were hearing dither noise added into <coughs> the 48 version. Interesting. Could be. I don't know. What I do is what you send me in uh, sample rates and things like that is what you get back. But right. if you send me a, a high resolution, then I'll, I'll, I'll master it in high res for you. That's how I do it. But the only time that I do any uh, changings for samples or anything, if you sent me a high res, but then you also want you know for you also want it to be produced onto CDs. Then I, that's when I, that's the only time really is when I downsample and dither to, to bring it down into CD format. Yeah. Cause most streaming services, I mean, most uh, aggregators like DistroKid and CD Baby, they all want 2440 in any way. Actually, CD Baby won't accept anything but 4416. Oh, really? Yep. No, I didn't know that. And I just ran into, I couldn't believe it. I, I provided it was a 44.1, 24-bit is, was my rendering. Yeah. For a recent client and they were <clears throat> unable to upload it to CD Baby. I was like, what? Really? And I, I was like, I can't believe it. There's nothing wrong with my render. I don't, you know, it's playing great. I don't know what the deal is. So I went out to CD Baby and uh, I was reading their documentation. I think this might have been a recent change and mm. they are now only accepting uploads for 44.116. Interesting. That surprises me because I even, I know Apple's like asking, you know, Selling people that they prefer twenty four ninety six. I'm like, I'm not doing ninety six. Yeah, that's. Ridiculous. I mean, I'm happy to accept. Yeah, yeah. send me over a ninety six. I can do that. I can do ninety six thirty two. You know, so whatever you want, I can double that. Actually, no one ever sends me. I get forty. I, I get forty one twenty four as ninety eight percent of the time. The rest of it is normally forty eight. Uh, I do get some forty eight thirty two and hmm. and forty eight twenty four. And that, that pretty much comprises everything. Yeah, I, I prefer I forty-eight received. twenty-four. I'll I'll take I'll take forty-four one. Well, I think you know a lot of uh, you know mix engineers aren't really willing to give up channels. When you go up to ninety-six, you have to have oh, yeah. half your channels. <clears throat> I don't know if listeners understand that, but in order to get that high of of sample rates, uh, you have to have your channels so that you i don't actually maybe i don't understand it completely either, but you have to have your channels in order to apply that processing into the remaining channels that you have in order to get that high bit rate so um and sample rate so if you have a 32 channel console but you want to go at uh 96 then you'll only have 16 channels available yeah so don't do that <laughs> but if you only need 16 channel, I mean, you can do a full band with, you know, with like seven or eight mics on a drum 
you know, with 16 channels in high res, or you can just do sessions, you know, yeah, you know, and put it, you know, put it together in post, but nobody does it though. Nobody does it. Not now anyway. Just keep it to 48. I would like to, to because I mean, it would be really nice to um, qualify for Apple masters, you know, and Mm -hmm. what is the MQA on title, you know, and things like that. Um, You know, because at 44, 16, I don't think that that qualifies for title uh, master quality. I don't think. Got it. I might be wrong on that, but I don't think so. I'll have to look that up. But no one, well, no one to date has asked me for that. So, <laughs> well, let me know when they do. I will let everyone know. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, I think we have an episode in the bag now. We can, and we can probably like delete like the first ten minutes and get this <laughs> back down to. A, yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm about to run out of space here. Um, well, thanks, Doug. It's been great catching up. Likewise. Hey, have a great thanks. rest of your week. And listeners, thank, you, thank you so much. Yes, thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. Yep. Uh, check us out where you can. Leave a review. Uh, like us and hit us up on social. And, and if you didn't, here, leave a review and check us out on social. Okay? Because <laughs> no one's leaving reviews. Now, come on. How hard is it? How hard is it? I don't know. I feel I like know. I have an attitude tonight. You know? <laughs> You know, give us a damn review. What the heck? <laughs> He's all fired up. He's all fired. Go have some bourbon, Doug. <laughs> Chill out. All right. All right. All right. Love Cheers, you, everybody. Take care. All right. Later. Cheers. Bye. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Indie Music Podcast. Please like and subscribe, share with your friends, or just leave us a review on iTunes if you like what you've heard. Find our social links and episode guide at IndieMusicCast.com. Until next time, keep creating.